Bruce, I'm going to leave it to you to welcome everybody. Thank you, Larry. Welcome everyone to today's webinar on artificial intelligence and the opportunities and risks it creates in teaching and learning. My name is Bruce Weber, and I'm the Dean of the Zicklin School of Business here at Baruch College, the William Coker Dean of the Zicklin School. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. And as I have joked with people, uh, July 17th, 2023 was my second first day as a, as a member of the Baruch community. I was on the faculty here at Baruch from 1998 to 2002 and was the founding director of the Subotnik Financial Services Center. So it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this event. And it's also just a personal uh, thrill for me to be back uh, here in Zicklin and uh, working with the tremendous team we have here. Uh, so with that, Larry, uh, let's get started. Let's get started. Now, I understand you've only been here a couple of months, less than a couple of months, so you can't know everything. I'm sure that by February, you'll know everything, but not this minute. So let, let's start. Let's talk about chat GPT. And I'll use chat as uh, an all-encompassing term for the various replicas of chat. Chat's coming in like a Ferrari. Nobody's going to stop it. Can we stipulate that? It's going to have to be accepted. It's here. I think you're right, Larry. Um Artificial intelligence has been around for several decades, um, but there was a real inflection point probably um, five to 10 years ago when the concept of a large language model or maybe a deep neural net, if you're in the, in the technology space, uh, began to really emerge as a general purpose technology. Um, up, till now, up till that time, most AI applications had pretty narrow domains of, of usefulness. Now, suddenly with ChatGPT, anybody who's, who's used it will notice that it's quite general and able to opine and provide reasonably strong, intelligent responses to a large variety of questions. So I think that's really been the, the, the shift that I think has is, is occurred. And I don't think we're gonna go back. There's a large part of the early days of artificial intelligence now um, that I would call expert systems or rule-based approaches that's really become obsolete very suddenly. And this learning approach that ChatGPT takes has really proven its value. So a lot of the learning that I had as a computer science and decision sciences uh, student and grad student um, using languages like Prolog and Lisp to write software uh, has really been overtaken. And we've found that ChatGPT does a much better job of replicating intelligence. And I think it's here to stay, Larry. Is, is ChatGPT the kind of an improvement, the kind of event that will change teaching and learning as we've experienced it in the past? I think it, it will, Larry. I think we've already seen the, the early changes um, that ChatGPT brings. Uh, a lot of fairly basic questions can be answered very competently um, by ChatGPT. So as an instructor, we're challenged now with coming up with the kinds of assignments and questions that really show you know, not just that, that somebody can um, provide a competent answer the way ChatGPT can, but actually show beyond that, that they have some depth of understanding. There's a distinction that I think people in, in the education world need to recognize between knowing something and understanding something. Understanding is much deeper, reflects the context, maybe reflects the person that you're presenting to. And we're going to find that AI is not as good as on the understanding side right now as it is at knowing. It knows so much because so much information has been digitized in the last 20 years and available to these learning models to build 
systems like ChatGPT, that the, the knowing part is now pretty much a general purpose technology, just like electricity was in the day, just like the PC appearing in the 1980s was. And I think now as educators, we need to recognize that moving beyond the, 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 the challenges to our students around knowing is not enough. We've got to move into the deeper contextual area of understanding. I, I'm, I'm really amazed that you're putting the words chat GPT in the same sentence as electricity and computers. Is it that significant in advance? Is it more than Google on steroids? I think if you understand Google and how it responds, you're going to see the these large language models like ChatGPT as another step in the evolution. So even though you know we're we're looking at something that's going to be transformative in education and going to be transformative in many industries, I think we still have to look at it as a progression where with Google, with other search engines, we could be directed towards information. We could be directed towards websites that had something that our search term suggested to Google we would be interested in. And now what ChatGPT and other learning models have done is take that final step, not just of pointing us to some information, but actually completing the answer, giving us the answer uh, rather than leaving it as Google does to us to digest the information and come back with the response. It, does that mean we're approaching human thought in a machine? Human thought is very complex, has very many elements to it, uh, Larry. And I think it's crucial to us as, as educators to recognize where machine intelligence has matched human intelligence and, and certainly knowing about something, being able to provide a competent response, being able to make predictions, machine intelligence has done well. Now, a lot of things that we call common sense, it turns out machine intelligence doesn't handle very well. A lot of common sense activities for us as people, even interpreting sentences, uh, having an understanding of, of an individual that you're talking to and whether their understanding of what you're sharing with them is, is complete or they're confused. AI is not good at that. That's something that is going to remain human intelligence, I think, for quite a few years. Kind of the deep personalization that an educator needs to do to bring a, a, a group of students or an individual student along to, to mastery of a subject. That's not well handled right now by machine intelligence. And I'll point to some things like, you know, the cultural dimension, different groups in a classroom, different cultural backgrounds, some other dimensions on which individuals differ. It's not something that AI does well to contextualize, to customize, to personalize. That's where people I think are going to continue to be ahead of machine intelligence, but the, the 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 opportunities that AI brings to educators are very strong. But it's not yet, in my opinion, a perfect replica of what a faculty member does at the front of the classroom over the course of a semester. Is that because we're early on in the evolution of chat AI? It remains to be seen, Larry, but we've had you know, now maybe 50 years of study of artificial intelligence. A Nobel Prize winner at uh, Carnegie Mellon, Herb Simon, uh, was working very uh, actively with a large group of colleagues in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, trying to build models, artificial intelligence models of human intelligence, using, as I mentioned before, the rule-based approach, assuming that we could create in an expert system a series of rules that really reflected what, what people uh, do in their reasoning. 
but it turns out that the models that were built really didn't do that good a job of representing human intelligence and human reasoning and language. It's simply uh, too complex to represent in rules. So I think what we've got now is with systems like ChatGPT that are based on learning, they're taking huge, huge volumes of, of information and data. And the learning algorithm is itself building the intelligence, but in a way that's not as open or transparent as the rule-based approach was. The way Herb Simon and the early researchers look at it was we could declare in software code human knowledge with, with rules, a complicated long list of rules would represent knowledge. And then we'd have a number of applications of those rules to different instances, either, you know, let's say uh, making an admissions decision at a university, making a medical diagnosis in a healthcare setting, um, maybe making a, a, a prediction about the weather, a prediction about financial market prices. And that distinction between the representation of the knowledge and the application of it has, has fallen by the wayside with chat GPT. We now have systems that provide very good intelligent answers, but that don't give us the ability to unpack what rules led to that forecast. What rules led you to diagnose my medical condition as diabetes, as renal failure, as pneumonia? The rules in chat GPT are hidden under many, many layers in their learning model under, under this, what I call the deep neural net before. And part of human intelligence, part of what we do as, as educators, Larry, is to explain our reasoning, explain the rules that led to our conclusion. And chat GPT is not going to do that for you. It's going to give you an answer that's going to be intelligent and solid, it's not going to tell you how it came up with that answer, which I think is is going to be a weakness uh, for quite some time. But if the ultimate ambition of chat is to do anything the human brain can do, but better, uh, it seems to me reasoning and problem solving, learning new tasks, communicating, reprogramming itself would be part of that continuum. Is that not fair? I think that's the goal, Larry, and what I believe we're going to see in the near term in education, in the way we teach and, and student learning, is to look at these AI tools as assistance as we do our jobs, assistance as we, uh, as we educate people. And you're already starting to see this in the world of publishing. So there's authors that have access to a number of AI-driven applications that can do things like, um, um, you know, look over writing and come up with suggestions to make the writing more clear or more punchy. There's AI um, products out there now that can take the plot, can take a book, take the story, and generate a book cover for that story simply by looking at the the language in the story to create the book cover. And to me, Larry, that's where we're going to be going in the near term as educators is looking at these AI tools, not as a substitute for teaching, not as a substitute for students gaining this deep understanding, not just knowing, but through thoroughly understanding. And the AI can be there as a tool for us to come up with that better level of understanding for the students by going through a course using the AI, not as a replacement for them responding to questions or as a replacement for a faculty member guiding them through the key principles of the course they're delivering, but as something that's there to provide, the AI is there to provide assistance and guidance and maybe uh, additional practice in, in building mastery. Well, let, let me talk about the students for a moment. Students are obviously using chat already. Uh, I can think in my own case, I had a student last uh, semester that 
wasn't particularly outstanding, but uh, and I had to warn him a couple of times about his papers and all the rest, but he wrote a brilliant final. And I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do about that? Uh, it's under his name. I'm not going to conduct a uh, forensic investigation. Um, so they're using it. How are students using chat right now? I think it depends what the task is in front of them. Um, and I'm, I think the faculty members, you know, and, and your exam question there, Larry, is one you need to look at and say, am I asking a question that's about knowing or is it a question about understanding? And I think the answer it sounds like you got from the student here uh, seemed to be suspicious to you. And it does look like, you know, they got some assistance that might not have been allowed. I don't know, you know, what your rules were around that exam. But I think it's crucial for us to realize that the, the standard stock questions that we might have asked five, 10 years ago need to be refined for the tools that are out there today. I mean, just imagine, you know, the, the you know, math teachers 50, 60 years ago as the calculator came out, they had to adjust the way you, you taught math. Now with the calculator, some of the things we might have done manually, um, long division, factoring, you've got calculators that can do that. And you notice most math, most, most math teaching I saw my children go through was about how to understand and use the features of the calculator to come up with the answer rather than teaching the more mechanical uh, approaches that, that I was taught uh, along the way. And, and you know, I'll think of a, an example from what I've taught for many years, which is courses on decision analysis and modeling. And with Excel, the approach to teaching students about optimization and linear programming became powered by Excel in a way that we hadn't previously seen. And the kinds of questions and assignments you gave needed to change to draw on the power of that new tool. So many of the problems maybe in Excel, um, you, you pre before we had spreadsheets, uh, problems you might've expected the students to work out uh, with a calculator and, um, and, and by hand, with Excel, the, the focus of what you were gonna be showing the students to do, kind of what their mastery was, needed to shift. The foundational understanding though was the same. We're teaching quantitative methods for analyzing business problems, operations problems, finance problems, marketing problems with data and with quantitative methodologies. But now we've got a much more powerful tool. And I think we need to look at ChatGPT as that same type of tool that's come along like a calculator, like a spreadsheet that force us to go back to what we're teaching as a foundation. What, what are the foundational subjects that we're teaching? And with this new tool, how do I refine and update and, and make my teaching more powerful by utilizing that tool rather than, you know, let's say forbidding the students from having a calculator as they work through math problems. Maybe there's, you know, there was a time when that might have been one teacher's approach, but I think what we've seen is the calculator, spreadsheets gave us a way to teach important subjects, but with a, uh, uh, with a way to bring the students to stronger understanding and stronger capabilities utilizing the tool rather than, than forbidding the tool from being available to them. But the, but the difference I see, Bruce, is that a calculator had a certain amount of information put into it and it couldn't learn anything more. ChatGPT seems to have the ability to learn and grow and incorporate all the facts that it learns and create a different output. The output that ChatGPT gives me now for a question I might add, ask, probably is different than the answer it'll give me a month from now. Same question. Because it's learning new things. Yeah. 
Well, you have to realize it's it's trained on a set of data that you know. I think we found uh, you know if you ask ChatGPT what its training date when its training data set ended, I believe it was uh, up to 2021. So I think we've got uh, you know a model that was trained on information available to it on the internet, digitized information up to that time. So the uh, the way you word the question, the way you provide input to chat GPT absolutely will affect the response you get. Just like you, you'd find that on Google too, different search terms, similar, um, you know, just slight changes in the, the search terms will give you a different set of links to, to follow through on in, in Google's response. And in chat GPT, you're going to find that similarly, you're going to have a slightly different wording of the the inquiry and chat GPT is going to bring back something different. Well, I think what the, 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 the key observation, you know, I, I want everybody to, to make though, is that the, um, the, the chat GPT response, nevertheless, um, does not have the ability to explain itself. It can give you a competent answer but it's not going to be in a position to explain why that was provided. And I think that's where the educator and the question uh, that we ask um, should be modified and updated to reflect that you can get that answer. But I would like to see my students think about the response that ChatGPT gave and provide reflection and comment on that, some kind of customization or contextualization that would make the, the chat GPT answer, um, uh, you, you know, something that they could explain themselves. They should be able in a position of mastery of, their, of, of that topic you've been teaching them to explain the response that they got from an AI tool. You mentioned the weatherman before. If I, as a consumer, tune into a weather channel, I'm interested in the weather report. Do I really want to know how we got there? I want an accurate weather report. Isn't that enough? It depends, Larry. Um, let me flip it back to my, my example in healthcare, though. You know, you go to the doctor, something's bothering you. They give you a diagnosis. You want to know what led to that diagnosis, which specific symptoms provided that explanation, that, that diagnosis, and, and maybe even that um, course of treatment that you might be put on. I think we have trust in domain experts like doctors, you know, like weathermen, weather people as well, to be able to explain their expertise to us in a way that we can understand. And I, I, you know, I think I've alluded to this already, but that's the key distinction between human intelligence and artificial intelligence at this point now is the ability to tell you, this is what led me to diagnose your condition, Larry, your symptoms as being this problem and this is how we're going to treat it. And this is why we're going to treat it that way. We could get from ChatGPT the, the diagnosis, but we wouldn't get the, the transparent presentation. We wouldn't get the transparent explanation of why we, as a professional, came to that conclusion. Yeah, but even doctors now very often say, you know, we did a blood test on you and we found an infection here, or we did a scan there and we found the following. Um, is that an explanation? Or do they really understand what the computers are doing in the scans or what the uh, blood analysis is being um, done? Is that just you know, cause and effect? We see this, we know it's that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like the medical analogy, Larry, because I think it does you know, raise this question of trust, right? When we, when we watch the weather report, we're just trying to decide whether we're going to bring our umbrella or not, whether we're going to put on a jacket or not. But, you know, when it becomes, uh, 
you know, when we get to healthcare, I think it becomes a little more uh, important and vital uh, to us to, to, to have trust in that response that we get. So, you know, a physician who's looking at blood test results has been trained to look for certain patterns. They may have had patients in the past that they guided through, uh, you know, something that was diagnosed that was a problem and they helped them get through it in a way that resolved the issue. And I, I, I think what I'm trying to emphasize here is there's a level of trust in the way professionals, including doctors and educators, go about that work that's essential to the end user of that service, right? You as a patient are going to be more trusting, be more confident in the diagnosis and the course of treatment you're gonna be put on when you get a thorough, transparent explanation of how that conclusion was arrived at. And again, the chat GPT model that has won out, that has beaten the rule-based approach that Herb Simon and Bruce Lennett at, at Stanford was, was famous for developing, um, would have provided the rules that the artificial intelligence tool applied to give you your diagnosis and give you your course of treatment. Chat GPT is opaque. And I think that opacity is where the educator has to look to the student for the new insight, the new, you know, the what's going to go beyond simply having a spreadsheet or having a calculator. What's going to go beyond getting a competent answer from chat GPT and having the student show something beyond simply knowing an answer, but to be able to actually understand it. You mentioned before that ChatGPT was trained roughly a year and a half ago, the end of 21. Isn't it a, only a matter of time between, before ChatGPT is learning in real time and is learning based on yesterday's information, not a year and a half information? I think so, Larry. And I'm sure people are working on that right now, um, ways to um, enhance and update the learning model without doing the full-blown training that went into chat GPT. And you know, what you'd realize if you talk to people that are in the computer hardware industry is the amount of processing power it takes to build these deep neural nets, large, large language models is enormous. So the chip makers, you know, the providers of, of uh, computing resources are scrambling to adjust to this new type of computation that's taking place. And they're probably going to have the ability to do that real-time updating uh, in, you know, it's at some point in the near future, because the, the business rewards to achieving that are going to be substantial. Um, so I think we are going to be seeing the AI tools getting stronger and more powerful. And again, the, the analogies with prior technologies, um, you know, I think still hold, you know, we've seen disruptions in, in technology like the internet, that challenged a number of industries. You know, book retailing is probably the most prominent. So Amazon's business model uh, could only be built on the internet being pretty accessible to almost everybody in the US at the time Amazon began to uh, disrupt that industry. Um, but I think if you look at the technology more broadly, more books were published in 2022 two than any year prior. So even though the traditional book retailer uh, has seen their, their square footage of, of physical retail space go down and Amazon's market share of book sales go up, the new approaches to things like self-publishing and other tools for getting uh, authors work out to readers um, has grown enormously. Uh, since the internet came onto the scene. So I'm looking forward to chat GPT providing that same sort of a technology base on which entrepreneurs and business leaders build on to make their products and services better and more convenient for, for the end con 
customers. And certainly, you know, we're talking today in the context of, of business school education. And I think it's the, it's, it's the same. We've, we've adapted our, our teaching to new technologies, to the internet with things like online programs, online teaching. And I think chat GPT is going to be another tool available to us as educators to update and enhance what we do for our students. Is it another tool or is it an overwhelming new dimension of teaching? The jury's still out on that, Larry. I, I want to point to this, um, this uh, article I saw um, and it, it was uh, in the New Republic and it was um, written in 1924 by the editor, Bruce Blyven. And this is what he wrote, 1924, remember? So the radio had just you know, arrived on the scene. This is pre-television. This is the radio suddenly making um, you know, every household connected, at least to, to audio. And he asked, is radio to become a chief arm of education? Will the classroom be abolished and the child of the future be stuffed with facts as he or she sits at home and even as they walk about the streets with a portable receiving device in their pockets? And in 1922, apparently New York University rolled out an entire radio-based college degree program that didn't require the student to go into a physical building simply to read textbooks and listen to radio broadcasts of professors lecturing. Within four to five years, all of those online degree programs at NYU and apparently Harvard, Columbia, University of Kansas University followed suit. They were closed within 10 years because the medium, the radio, did not create the environment for learning that you need to have. So I've seen a lot of technologies that appear capable of replicating higher education. They don't ultimately prove successful because there's something beyond the radio that has to happen. There's something beyond chat GPT that has to happen for an educational experience to truly be transformative to that student. And I think we see technologies come along with promise, but I believe there's still a number of elements in education that while AI is gonna give us more powerful tools to improve learning, I don't think it's a substitute yet for what faculty members do. When you bring on new faculty over the next few years, how will your guidelines change as to the faculty you want to see at the school versus, let's say, what you did five or 10 years ago? Well, let me just flip it a little bit, Larry, and let you know that the, the market for the job candidates themselves is very competitive. There's a lot of students completing PhD programs in business subjects every year who need to demonstrate to the business schools that are out there, like the Zicklin School, that they are going to be a good addition to the faculty and who are themselves keeping up with these developments and therefore their candidacy is gonna be that much stronger. So I think we're already seeing that from our candidates that the way they have done their research, uh, the presentations they give, their use of technology um, as they um, show up as, as, as candidates for our, our openings, they're demonstrating already this technical competency that I think our school and our students need and, and you know, will demand down the road. So we're already seeing faculty that join us bringing types of teaching, modalities of delivering their, their material that are different from the candidates that, you know, I guess I was competing for the, the opening that I eventually got at, at, at the Stern School 
uh, Larry, when you and I met in the early 1990s. Uh, those those skill sets that I had have, have become obsolete. The new candidates for our openings, though, they're coming to this with a stronger background in the, using these tools in education. And they're, in effect, competing to show us that they're going to be on the cutting edge of these developments. So I think it's up to Zicklin School faculty to think through what we want our new faculty members to, to bring to the table as far as their research skills, the topics they choose, but also their technical competence to um, push the, the boundaries forward in, in their fields and in, in the teaching that they're gonna do for us. I'm assuming there will be faculty that can't keep up to this rapidity of change. How do you handle that? How much aid can you give them? How much aid do they want? Yeah. One of the things that makes an academic career very rewarding, and I've, I've only come to appreciate it kind of later on, is we're very reliant on our peers. You get published in your academic field by persuading your peers that you've got a research insight and a result and a contribution to make that need that should show up in, in this journal, this academic, you know, elite research journal. So what I look to, Larry, is us as faculty, us as peers, faculty peers, working with each other to bring each other along to applying these tools in our teaching in the way that's best for us. Every faculty member has a different approach to how they're gonna run their class, how they're gonna run their classroom. You know, we call that academic freedom. And, if, you know, of course, as a dean, you know, I've gotten complaints from parents about their son or daughter not appreciating the teaching style of this professor or that professor. And one of the things, you know, I point out is it's important in a university setting when we are hiring faculty members who've been trained at the best universities in the world, coming out of the strongest PhD programs in the world, that they have the latitude to bring their knowledge, their insights, their methods of, of teaching in the way that they think is most appropriate. And for a school like the Zicklin School to prescribe how a classroom you know, should be run or how a course should be taught, I think would be missing the fact that we're bringing in these highly capable, highly trained individuals who are very capable of learning from their peers to improve their teaching, to bring new technologies into their classrooms. But I try to rely on the faculty themselves coaching, mentoring, peer guiding one another to, to, to make that classroom experience that much better for the student. I hope I got it, the, the question, Larry. Does that mean we're gonna to have to put more emphasis on helping faculty on providing the forums that enable the faculty to share uh, all provided by the school? I think the school's gonna take the lead on that, Larry. We've got a Center for Teaching and Learning here, here at Baruch, and they've already held a number of seminars and workshops for faculty around these tools and how to you know, address, uh, you know, in the past, I, you, know, with, you know, with Google, we had issues around plagiarism and um, failing to cite external sources. So we've We've got some experience with this. And now I think with ChatGPT, it brings a whole new set of teaching and learning questions. And I think we've been very um, you know, active bringing these uh, teaching and learning insights to the faculty from people that are entirely focused on pedagogy and, and pedagogical innovation um, and helping the, the faculty again through this peer mentoring um, mechanism uh, take advantage of the, these new tools, but also prepare themselves for the um, the challenges that that they're going to provide in 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 the 
fact that the students can often take assignment questions that would have been challenging in the past and get uh, a very strong answer without doing any of the important work to come up with that answer. Do you think libraries will become obsolete? I think libraries have changed their approach over time. And I don't think they're slated for obsolescence, but I think what you're finding is the librarian profession, the library professionals are becoming part of this peer network that I'm describing where they're not prescribing to a particular faculty member how to uh, deliver a course, how to carry out a research project but to show them some of the tools that are out there, some of the references, some of the data sources that are going to be helpful. I think you know, one of the things we've learned from, from Google is the value of reference sources that are not part of the Google search engine responses. So, you know, the library subscribes to a number of different uh, data sources, you know, some of which you're familiar with, Larry, FactSet, ABI Inform, many of these are not publicly accessible, therefore not part of the, the Google search response. But that's often where the best data, the best information on a particular subject is for a student writing a research paper or a faculty member carrying out a project. And I think the librarians are there now to be the, you know, the, the, the tour guides, if you will, of all of the different reference sources that are available, some of which faculty um, aren't aware of until the library professionals make them aware. Are architecturally beautiful libraries on campuses with a million books, artifacts? What I would invite you to do, uh, Larry, to answer that question is I want you to um, walk around a couple of the floors of the Newman Vertical Campus Building and drop in on a few of the faculty members that we've hired since, let's say, 2010, 2015, compared with the offices of faculty that were hired in the 80s and the 90s, my vintage. You don't find books in journals stacked up on the shelves. The newer faculty know that all these sources are available to them online anywhere. So I think the physical representations of this information that we used to want in our offices, one in our library, is going away. But what we do want is, you know, what I would call curated access, navigation help to finding those sources that we might not have been aware of and that we wouldn't learn about from Google, because like I said, Google is just scratching the surface of the information that's out there. It's it's good for some sort of quick answers on, on you know, finding some information, but it's not going to help you, you know, when you want to do an in-depth, detailed research project and you want to get original sources uh, to help you with that or, or un, un, you know, highly original data sets that might not be, uh, you might not be aware of initially. Should we assume that every student will have an assistant called chat that never sleeps, never gets drunk, never gets hungry, and the student will learn mostly on their own and use faculty and university halls uh, to corroborate what they've learned? Is it going to be much more home learning? I think we're... We're seeing this transition already, Larry, which is almost any learning objective that a faculty member can have. And remember, we're accredited by AACSB, so we do have to do assessment of learning in a very formalized way. We need to demonstrate that we are meeting our learning objectives in all of our courses and for our degree programs. So I think the, the, the way we're approaching that is already changing. You have this concept of a flipped classroom now, where maybe in the past, the classroom time would have been a lecture going through 
five or six concepts, we can now assign the students maybe a video explaining those four or five concepts, use the classroom time to actually work through several exercises and discuss how you apply those concepts in a practical setting. And I see faculty approaching their, their classes in this way to a greater degree every year. And I think that's kind of where I imagine we're going to see the, the assistant that you're describing. The student is going to be asked to build up the background knowledge to come to the classroom ready for a deep discussion using chat GPT to gain familiarity with the concepts and maybe answers to a few standard questions. And I think the classroom time then becomes looking at some of the nuances, some of the subtleties, some of the customization that I was describing before to really push beyond what you're gonna get back from the AI tools that are out there today. So I think the, the concept of the assistant is, is a good one. Uh, and I think it, it changes the classroom from a time of, um, you know, you might, you know, look at it as a one-way flow of information from the faculty member to the students in a lecture to being one where there's knowledge sharing among the students themselves and with the faculty there as that, that narrator or that guide to learning. Do you think ChatGPT will accelerate the, uh, the graduation rate, the time of graduation, and perhaps uh, the number of people who graduate as a percentage of those who start? I haven't thought about that, uh, Larry, but I'd like to believe so. And, and the reason is we've had a nice improvement um, in retention and graduation rates at a number of business schools, including my former college at, at the University of Delaware and here at the Zicklin School I've seen in the data. Data is being used, evidence-based approaches to student, student success have really come on strong the last four or five years. I wouldn't call them AI-driven techniques, but we're in a much better position now to use data on which courses prove the most challenging to students to get through, what are the early warning signs of a student who might not be retained? And what interventions can the business school use to help a student who maybe didn't choose the major that's the best fit with their skills and their capabilities? What can we do in our advising offices to maybe bring a student who's shown you know, through these evidence-based techniques that the higher level courses are gonna prove challenging and what can we do to um, offer some options, offer some alternatives, keep the student um, on path for completion, but maybe with some modifications, again, using the evidence, using the data that's there. So I think what ChatGPT does is it pushes that concept even forward. So evidence-based advising, and I think uh, for students being able to rely on an assistant to guide them through, you know, maybe some of the things they're struggling with in an individual class. If, if the professor's explanation of this concept or the way I solved this problem wasn't correct, let me use ChatGPT to find a different explanation or to see a number of other examples worked through so I can master this topic. That wasn't available to you and me when we were getting our degrees. It is now, and I think it should help graduation and retention. Just one last question for me before Gwen gets on. Do you think the curriculum will change to help people master ChatGPT? Because my own experience is, depending on how I ask the question, I get vastly different answers. Mm -hmm. and there, there's obviously a skill in asking the right question. Yeah. I think it's important to look at prior technologies, Larry, in answering that. So when we had calculators, you know, when the HP 12C came out, you know, did we change the way we taught, you know, core finance? Yes, there were some adjustments. The basic principles and learning objectives of the course stayed the same, 
the tool enabled us to go further and give the students, you know, I think a stronger preparation. When spreadsheets came out, we changed the way we taught a number of the, the analytics courses. So again, ChatGPT, I would say similarly, what we're gonna see is the, the curriculum, individual courses being updated and modified. The basic learning objectives though, I see as stable. Those are the foundational principles that aren't going away. How you deliver it is changing. And again, you know, look at this, you know, these radio course programs back in the 1920s, right? A hundred years ago, we didn't realize that, you know, a radio program and textbooks weren't the complete substitute for showing up at a classroom, showing up at a college uh, for, for, your, for your, your degree program and to go through the curriculum that had been developed. So I think the curriculum will be adjusted. I think it'll be modified. I think individual courses are going to change. Um, I think what we're trying to accomplish with the, with the, um, you know, with the degree programs we have, though, will will be, um, will be uh, less, will be more stable. You know, I think the general purpose of education is is unchanged, right? We're we're developing mastery, competence, and then a broader understanding of of you know context to be a manager, to be a business leader. How we do that has been shifting and will continue to shift. And I think with, with chat GPT and AI, we're probably seeing you know, a shift that might be bigger, larger than some of the prior shifts that I'm pointing to like calculators. Go ahead. Ah, it's been very interesting. Um, there have been a number of questions, but the overwhelming majority of them actually are asking about uh, support for faculty and how faculty will, will adjust. And you've talked a lot about that in detail, uh, but Bruce, uh, could you give a little more um, information on specific uh, projects that the Center for Teaching and Learning is undertaking to support faculty uh, use and adaptation to AI tools? Yeah, thanks, Gwen. I'm, I'm, um, I'm pleased that's a big topic. I mean, that shows people want to Get up the learning curve here. Now, one thing I should say, remember I joked my my second first day was July 17th. So I don't have the deep familiarity with the Center for Teaching and Learning's offerings here. I'm aware and have been told by a number of people that they have done programs already looking at things like chat GPT and ways to, to ask questions that maybe um, go beyond what uh, a chat GPT answer could do or ways to reframe an assignment um, to leverage AI tools, but to still provide the, um, the, the, the students a chance to build understanding and demonstrate mastery. Uh, so I'd encourage that. One of the things I'm noticing um, is when I look at academic conferences now, uh, things like the Academy of Management and the INFORMS conference that I, I go to every um, few years is they're adding more sessions on on teaching and learning and and education. These used to be pretty much research conferences solely, but beginning I don't know t uh, ten maybe uh, fifteen years ago, you began to see more sessions, maybe you know pre conference or post conference events that really dealt with. Um, new ways of learning with new tools. And I, I remember, you know, at the INFORMS conference, a faculty member at University of Chicago, John Burge, who developed basically all of the really good um, learning cases using the optimization tools and simulation tools in, in Excel. And for a lot of us who used to teach Lindo and GAMS, which were very cumbersome software packages, being able to do our teaching in Excel was very desirable. I went to those sessions and it did improve uh, the way I taught those courses. So I'd encourage all the Zicklin faculty to think about their academic conferences as a place to gain some additional teaching insights, uh, as well as what we do in Center for Teaching and Learning. Thank you very much. Uh, let's just switch this to the student side. What advice would you give our undergraduate students as they're, as they're using these tools in their courses? Yeah. 
what I always remember, you know, hearing from students is, you know, I'm I'm really interested in um, my subject area here, the topic I'm studying, and I'm very eager to find an exciting career opportunity when I graduate. One of the things to be aware of is all of the companies that you know students would be eager to interview for a position with are themselves using these AI tools. So some of the things that can happen in a recruiting environment today would be looking for you, you know, as a student to show that you can go beyond an answer that a chat GPT tool could provide. You know, think about, you know, something like develop a marketing plan for, you know, a new brand of toothpaste, for instance, right? Chat GPT will give you an answer to that um, and provide a marketing plan based on its ability to data mine all of the other marketing plans that have been put on the, the internet up till 2021. And it will be a solid response. But if what you provide in that position, if, if what you're bringing to the table is simply cap is something that would be pr produced by ChatGPT, they're going to find that ChatGPT, which is free, is going to be um, a substitute. And you want to make sure that what you're able to do is go beyond these tools, use these tools but enable the, the contribution you make um, to be um, special and to, to not be replicated by an artificial intelligence tool. Show that you can use AI as an assistant, but that your contribution goes well beyond uh, a chat GPT response. Have you, have you thought, or has the school thought about the industries that will be most affected by chat GPT? and perhaps change our curriculum to reflect those changes? I think that's, I, I think we're starting to see a lot of the, um, the, the forecasters predicting where, you know, AI tools are going to be the, um, have the biggest impact and be the most uh, disruptive. And I think it's the industries where the, the quantity of data and the amount of um, sort of knowledge work is, is the highest. So, you know, I think financial services, um, I think is, is you know, going to see a lot of AI based um, disruption. Um, I think some of the, the industries like publishing, you're going to see similar, uh, you know, AI based disruptions. So I think they're, you know, I think the jury's still out on, on exactly who the winners and losers are going to be, Larry. Um, but I think, you know, coming back to the students, I think they want to make sure that when they bring, you know, their skill set to the table, that the the companies they're recruiting with are going to see that they've got an ability to go beyond the um, the answers that a, an AI tool is going to provide. I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it at this. Um, in the chat, we've uh, there's been an, uh, an explosion of uh, links to the Center for Teaching and Learning uh, and to blogs. Um, at this point, I'm, I want to thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Larry, for an interesting discussion, which actually could have gone on quite a bit longer. I want to let our audience know that our next webinar is October 10th. It is Law, Religion, and Business, How to Balance Competing Fundamental Rights. Uh, it's with our own law professor, Debbie Kavanagh, and a guest professor, Lucian Duge, from the Georgia Institute of Technology. So we look forward to seeing you all on October 10th. And thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.